Hello, good afternoon. My name is Roger Cracknell. I work for Shell, and I'm also a member of the Powertrain Systems and Fuels Group of the IMEC E. On behalf of the IMEC E, I'd like to very much welcome you to the webinar on future fuels for road transport biofuels. The presentation will consist of a talk by Joe Howes from E4 Tech. Joe will introduce herself in a minute. This will last approximately 40 minutes, during which time you'll be able to submit questions. And there'll be 20 minutes afterwards, during which Joe will answer some of those questions. So with no more ado, I'd like to proceed with these slides. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Joe Howes. I'm from E4Tech, and I'm talking to you today about future fuels for road transport, and in particular, about biofuels. So I'm from E4Tech. We're a strategy consultancy based in the UK and in Switzerland. We focus on sustainable energy, um, and we've been around for over 20 years. I've actually worked myself at E4Tech since 2002, um, but also within that time, I spent three years at BP um, in the biofuel strategy team of BP's alternative energy business. So within E4Tech, we help clients across the sustainable energy sector, including governments, companies, large and small, and investors, to answer questions that they have about the future of energy. And those questions can involve thinking about technology, involve thinking about markets, involve policy, involve sustainability. A large proportion of our work is in low carbon transport. Um, and that's both on the, the vehicle side in road and marine and aviation and actually increasingly in rail, um, but also on the fuel side, um, like the biofuels I'll be talking about today. We also think a lot about the sustainability of those vehicles and fuels in combination, both from a greenhouse gas point of view, but also thinking about things like air quality um, and other life cycle impacts. So today's webinar is all about biofuels, and particularly how they could help in decarbonizing transport. And I've been asked to talk about three main questions today. Firstly, how do biofuels fit into decarbonization of transport? And do we even need biofuels when there are so many other options available? The second one is the state of the art in biofuels. What kinds of biofuels do we use today? And what kinds are in development for the future? And importantly, why? And thirdly, to talk about what's driving biofuels uptake. In most cases, they're more expensive than fossil fuels that they replace. So why is anybody using them today? And why is anybody interested in using them in the future? And obviously, the flip side of that, which is what's stopping those biofuels being developed or being used in greater volumes? So the first one of these is how do they fit into the decarbonisation of transport. So when we think about the emissions from transport, we can think where, where they're coming from in the production, use, and end of life of a vehicle and of the fuel that supplies it. And analysis that we've done um, for gasoline internal combustion engine vehicles shows that most of the greenhouse gas emissions from an internal combustion engine vehicle are related to producing and using the fuel. So, and these are obviously approximate numbers because it, it varies from case to case, but the vehicle production and end of life is only about 25% of the greenhouse gas emissions that come from that whole chain. Now, clearly, if we're going to get to net zero, it's important to reduce all of these emissions. Um, and there's not particularly a, a, a reason to prioritize one of them over another, but today I'm talking about those fuel emissions, which, as I said, have a large impact and, importantly, can be reduced today without a time lag needed to change the vehicle itself. Biofuels are one of the main options to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from fuels. Firstly, what are biofuels? We define those as renewable fuels made from biomass. So this means crops, which could be food or feed crops, or could be dedicated crops for energy. It could be from wood, it could be from agricultural residues, or the part of municipal solid waste which comes from a biomass source. There are two other interesting options that people are looking at today. Um, one of those you might have heard called e-fuels or power to x, that's 
making renewable electricity into fuels through producing hydrogen and then combining that hydrogen with carbon dioxide. And the other one of those is recycled carbon fuels. They're also called low carbon fossil fuels sometimes, which is using waste that's fossil, like plastics, or maybe even making fossil fuels, but with lower emissions through doing carbon capture and storage. What I haven't mentioned here is electrification, which obviously is another way if you use renewable electricity to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions from the fuel part of the chain. And some people say, well, why can't we just electrify everything? Why do we need to think about other options for decarbonizing the fuel part of the chain? And that's a question for me of the timing of the greenhouse gas emissions reduction, but where it's also important to think about the mode of transport that you're talking about. So this graph shows the IEA's two degree scenario. And it shows the final energy consumption in transport across different sectors. And you can see that they project that by 2050, the energy demand from the road sector decreases quite sharply. And that's mainly because of um, increasing electrification, um, saving the energy needed to provide the services in that sector. And electrification is something that in the road sector um, can contribute significantly to reducing energy use and re reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But that does take time. And so it's important to know that biofuels are reducing emissions in the light and heavy duty sectors today. And they can continue to reduce those emissions in those sectors while the alternatives ramp up even if electrification and potentially switch to hydrogen in heavy vehicles happens as fast as anyone think it might, there's still a residual liquid fuel demand around for a long time, and the more we can do to decarbonize that, the better. When we think about aviation, the picture's a bit different. So despite the fact there's investigation going on into hydrogen and electric planes, those are still at the prototype stage, with people expecting that aviation will require liquid fuels for the foreseeable future. Shipping is a bit more complicated because there are actually several different decarbonizations being investigated quite seriously, which could be hydrogen, ammonia, gas, a whole range of different options. But biofuels are being tested and are starting to be used in some types of ships today. And as a result, modeling that's been done by the European Commission that on how we might get to net zero shows an increasing use of biofuels to 2050. And that's in all of the scenarios that they look at. So I won't explain this quite complicated graph, but the point is that is it, is it contains 10 different scenarios for how we might meet transport energy supply in 2050. And those scenarios assume different things about how successful electrification is, how successful hydrogen is, how successful power to liquids is. The important thing that is, is that in all of those scenarios, there's an increase in use of biofuels anyway with biofuels supplying between 17 and 26% of transport energy demand in the net zero scenarios in 2050. So there's an important role for biofuels to play. So if there is this important role for biofuels, what kind of biofuels might we use? In this section, I'm going to talk about the biofuels that we're using today and what we might use in the future. So in 2019, biofuels made up nearly 6% of transport energy demand in the EU. Um, the graph shows the total, which is in green, um, and it also shows you that most of those are what we call conventional biofuels, that's the line in yellow. There's a smaller proportion that comes from biofuels that are made from waste oils and fats in red, and from advanced biofuels, which is the blue line that doesn't get very far off zero at the bottom. And I'll talk more in the next slides about what those different definitions mean. But the important thing that is that in most countries in the EU, biofuels are in transport fuels that are being used today, even if the drivers don't necessarily know that. So today's biofuels, those conventional biofuels as I termed them, are mainly produced from food or feed crops, and that's the top bar on this slide. And so that's things like corn that's used to make ethanol in the US, sugarcane in Brazil, um, wheat in the EU, and 
uh, vegetable oils like rapeseed oil or waste oils like waste cooking oils that can be used to make biodiesel fuels. Now the thing about these routes is that the technology that's needed to convert that feedstock into a fuel that can be used in a vehicle is mature today and widely commercialized in different parts of the world, in some cases having been used for decades. However, as you may have heard, there have been concerns in the past about using food and feed crops to make biofuels. There have been concerns about the potential for competition with food, and there have also been concerns about the potential knock-on effects on greenhouse gas emissions, for example, whether or not some of these routes might uh, drive deforestation. Now, in the UK and in the EU, we have sustainability policy um, within biofuels policy, which is intending to minimise those impacts uh, and in some cases restrict the use of some of those fuels. But because of those concerns, people started to think more in any case about alternative ways to produce biofuels. And that uh, tends to be those from lignocellulosic feedstocks, the middle bar on this chart. So these are non-food or feed feedstocks. Um, lignocellulosic essentially means woody. Um, so these are things like crops that are grown for energy, agricultural residues like straw, wood residues from the forestry industry, or again, the biomass fraction of waste. Now, because they're lignocellulosic, they're woody, they're not as easy to convert into fuel as a conventional feedstocks. But technologies are being developed that can break the stronger bonds between uh, those feedstocks and break them down to be able to, to make fuels. There are also novel feedstocks on the horizon, things like algae, um, which are at a much earlier stage of R&D, but people are interested in because potentially they might be able to give good yields or easier conversion to fuels in the future. So I'm going to take you through each of the routes um, that I've talked about here. And the first three routes that I'm going to talk about are those conventional ones. So as I said, Ethanol is being used today, um, blended into gasoline. Um, in the EU, it's particularly from, from grains um, like wheat and from sugar beet, though there's well-established industries producing it from sugar cane in Brazil and from corn in the US. It can be blended with gasoline at low levels, 5% um, in the UK at the moment, but potentially with the prospect of increasing that to 10% by volume. Or it can be used in higher blends, uh, in, in vehicles that are designed for that. So, um, for example, there are vehicles that can run on E85 or an 85% blend of ethanol and gasoline. I think that this route offers a, a good potential for greenhouse gas savings from the gasoline pool today, um, but those blend limits do limit the amount that can be used in Europe at the moment. In addition, policy in the EU and in the UK to incentivize biofuels, which I'll talk more about a bit later, has a cap on use of food or feed feedstocks so that those impacts, the sustainability impacts that I talked about are, are minimized um, and so that there's an incentive to move towards the, the more advanced fuels. The other thing to think about, and it goes back to the graph I showed earlier, is that Increasing and progressive electrification of passenger cars is likely to reduce the gasoline pool more than it reduces the diesel pool. So there is a, there's a shrinking overall market for, for gasoline um, when you look out to 2030 or 2050. Nevertheless, I think there's, a, there's an important opportunity to, to increase the amount of, of ethanol that we use um, in vehicles today. The main route we, we use in Europe at the moment is biodiesel. So this is a fuel that's made from oil, and they could be crops or they could be waste oils. At the, at the moment, we use large proportions of um, waste cooking oil and tallow to produce fuels in the UK. And they are processed via a chemical route to produce FAME, or fatty acid methyl ester, um, which is a fuel that can be blended at 5 to 10 percent in road diesel um, and can also be used in some other sectors as well. Um, the EU is the largest producer of this fuel and the largest user of this fuel globally. As with ethanol, though, there, is a, there are limits that limit the market size and the potential of this route. Um, so the cap on the type of feedstocks that are used and also 
the limit because of those blend walls. In addition, the, the risks related to the feedstocks that are used for biodiesel are thought to be larger than those for the ethanol feedstocks. And so because of that, there are additional policy constraints over the use of one particular feedstock, palm oil, um, because of concerns over greenhouse gas impacts. And so that policy actually also phases out the use of palm oil or any other oils that, that are seen to produce that impact in the future to 2030. So the last one of these uh, conventional fuels I'm going to talk about is HVO, um, or hydrotreated vegetable oil. Now, this takes the same feedstocks as biodiesel, as the, as the same biodiesel that I talked about on the previous slide, but processes them by a different route, which ends up with a hydrocarbon fuel which is much more chemically similar to diesel. And as a result, HVO can be blended at much higher levels into diesel. Also, uh, a slightly more heavily processed version of this route can be used to produce heifer, which is used in the uh, is, is being considered in the aviation sector. It's not widespread yet, but it has been trialed and does work, and there's a lot of interest in that route. So this route is at an earlier stage than, than FAME biodiesel, but is growing rapidly. The producers that are producing today are mainly focusing on using waste oils and fats, um, because that's what the policy is pushing them towards and also because there's a lot of interest from consumers of those fuels, particularly in the aviation industry, to, to um, avoid um, impacts of using uh, crop-derived fuels. But this doesn't have the limitation that I talked about for ethanol and for fame of, of blend walls. Um, there's plenty of market available for any HVO and heifer that can be, be produced today. So that's the conventional fuels. I also said that there were a number of advanced biofuels technologies that, that have been investigated and in some cases are at an early stage of commercialization. Now, this is a simplified version of an incredibly complicated diagram which you could show to present every feedstock that anybody's thinking about to go through any route to produce a biofuel to end up with actually quite an even larger range of, of blends. Um, and different types of fuels that could be used in different types of vehicles. Where the conventional routes that I've just talked about are in the lighter shade of purple, and the newer routes are in the darker one. So, as I said at the beginning, the reason for interest in these routes is to take lignocellulosic feedstocks that potentially have a higher resource potential and lower sustainability impacts, and in some cases may even be cheaper, and convert those into a fuel that we can and use, either a liquid or a gaseous fuel. Now, those routes are at very different levels of commercial development, starting right back from a technology readiness level of, of, of one to three, being at the research stage, right up to those that are, are ready for commercialization or, or commercialized today, in the case of anaerobic digestion, which is the one at the right-hand side, which produces a, a gaseous fuel, biomethane. So because they're at very different levels of, of commercial development, um, they have quite different needs in terms of um, what will bring them to market. And importantly, they, have, they differ in other factors that affect how soon and how much they might be able to contribute towards policy targets and towards supplying those demands and the demands of decarbonisation in different sectors. Um, they have different costs, partly because of being at different stages of development. Um, they have different resource potentials depending on what feedstocks they can use. Um, and they can go into to different end uses uh, depending on the, the, the type of molecules that are produced. And that's just a few examples. So I'll bring out some of those as I go through. So one of the most developed routes to, to advanced biofuels is cellulosic ethanol. So making ethanol, just like I talked about before, but from the woody feedstock. So Developers at the moment are focusing on using agricultural residues, things like corn stover or bagasse, which is the residue from, from sugar cane or, or wheat straw, and breaking that material down and then fermenting it uh, in the same way as you'd ferment something to make alcohol, uh, you know, that we've done for thousands of years, um, to make 
uh, ethanol that can be blended with gasoline. And importantly in that process, it's the breaking down bit that's particularly hard, as well as the fermentation being a little bit different because of uh, the composition of the feedstock. So this route has got multiple first commercial scale plants operating around the world. But it's also had a bit of a checkered history over the last few years. And actually this table, um, which has been you know, presented in different forms in E4Tech in the last few years, has varied a bit because some plants have not worked as expected, or more importantly, some companies have had some problems, um, not always because of their ethanol technology, but because of other parts of their business um, not being successful. Nevertheless, there, these are plants that are at a commercial scale that are focusing on commercializing this technology. The next route that I'm going to talk about is uh, producing methanol. So this is similar to the, the cellulosic ethanol route. It's starting with lignocellulosic biomass, and it's similar in that it ends up with an alcohol which can be blended into gasoline for use in transport. But the difference is, instead of having a biological process in the middle, um, it has a thermochemical process. And the thermochemical process starts off with gasification. So the feedstock is heated up, and the feedstock is broken down to form a syngas which is a mixture of hydrogen and carbon monoxide. So you've effectively broken, broken the feedstock down into, into very small constituent parts and then build it back up again through a catalytic synthesis process to produce the fuel that you want. So this is also at first commercial plant scale um, through Enochem in Canada with several more projects planned by, by Enochem um, to produce fuel, but also interestingly to produce chemicals. The next route is the same as that route at the beginning in that it takes lignocellulosic biomass and it goes through a gasification and then a catalytic chemical synthesis process. But instead of making methanol, it makes Fischer-Tropsch liquids, FT liquids, like diesel, kerosene or naphtha. And the idea is that those could be drop-in fuels. Now, you might hear this word drop-in fuels used quite a lot with sometimes slightly different definitions. But basically, it means a fuel that is chemically similar enough to fossil fuels today that it could be dropped in uh, and used at relatively high blends in those fuels. It's not always 100%, which some people might say, but it, it's high enough blends to not produce too much of a barrier to um, commercialization today. Now, this route ha also has first commercial plants planned, but not yet operating. So they're under construction. And there's a lot of interest in this area from the aviation industry as well as from, from road transport and other sectors. Again, though, there have been project failures or abandoned plans and plants in the past, which does mean that there has been some, some doubt about these routes. But I mean, our view as, as E4Tech is that those have to be seen as specific to the project and aren't, shouldn't be taken as, a, as an indication of the future success of this route overall. Now, I could go on about all of the other routes that people are considering that I showed on that early simplified graph, but I'm going to stop on this slide, which explains that there are several other routes on the horizon. So um, one of them, pyrolysis, um, is interesting because it produces an oil as an intermediate that then can be upgraded to uh, form different types of fuels. And hydrothermal liquefaction, the top row on the table, does, a, does the same thing. I wanted to show the other ones on the table just to make it clear that there is a pipeline of routes coming through the technology readiness level stages um, and plenty of companies interested in this area who see the demand in the future for liquid fuels from lignocellulosic materials that can help to meet the policy targets that I'll talk about in a second. So in summary, to finish this section, um, this is a really heavily simplified table to just summarize what I've said. Conventional biofuels provide savings in terms of greenhouse gas emissions today, but their potential is limited. Advanced routes have higher costs, but also a higher long-term potential because the resource availability for those um, routes could be much higher because it encompasses a whole range of different types of feedstocks. So my last section is about encouraging the uptake of biofuels. What's going to make this happen? 
Now, biofuels pretty much always have higher costs than fossil fuels. And actually, most decarbonisation options in transport have higher costs than the incumbent technologies. But because biofuels have had higher costs than fossil fuels, that uptake that I talked about around the world has relied on policy support, both at a national level, things like the renewable fuel standard in the US, or at a regional level, so things like the California low carbon fuel standard. And those targets that um, have been around in some cases for, for over a decade has what's, uh, have been what's driven the uptake that we've seen so far. Those targets are really important because not only do they set quite often the, the quantities of biofuels that need to be used or the greenhouse gas reduction that needs to come from the use of those fuels, but they also set requirements about the sustainability of the biofuels uh, or the other low carbon fuels that can be used and what characteristics are needed for those fuels to qualify. So the main policy supporting biofuels in the EU is the Renewable Energy Directive 2. We call it RED2. And this will come into force from this year um, and runs until 2030 and sets a 14% target for renewable energy in road and rail transport. So 14% of the energy used in road and rail transport needs to be renewable. Uh, importantly, if renewable energy is used in aviation, for example, it can contribute towards that target, but it doesn't form part of the target itself. Now, that 14% total target has to be made up in certain ways. So 3.5% of it has to be advanced biofuels, which are biofuels made from a list of feedstocks, um, which are mostly those lignocellulosic feedstocks that I talked about earlier on. However, and this gets complicated, those are also double counted towards the target. So actually, the effective target is half of that in, in energy terms. There's also a cap on the contribution towards that target from crop-based biofuels, those food and feed crop-based biofuels that I talked about earlier. And that can be up to 7%, um, but it, it can be lower than that in some particular member states. There's also a limit on the amount of feedstock with high indirect land use change impact, and that's where I talked about the, the um, cap and the phase out on palm that we'd seen before. There's a limit on the contribution that can come from waste oils and fats um, because uh, there was concern uh, about the potential for, for those feedstocks and what the resource availability really was. And there's another multiplier of 1.2 for uh, fuels that are used in aviation and marine to try and encourage use in those sectors as long as they're not food-based. So, this is a fairly complex picture of, of interconnected and nested targets. But overall, this means that every European country should be putting into place policy over the next year or two to make sure that this is implemented um, in their country and that the target they're trying to meet for 2020 of 10% goes up to 14% by 2030 with a significant share of those, of those advanced biofuels. In the UK, this has been implemented in the past and is expected to continue to be implemented through a policy called the Renewable Transport Fuels Obligation. So this is an obligation on, on sub fuel suppliers to make sure that a certain proportion of th their supply is from fuels that, that qualify. Um, that target is set to increase annually to 12.4% by 2032 but that does include double counting of some types of fuel towards the target. Within that, there's a cap on the crop-based fuels, which reduces over time to 2.33% by 2030. And also, as you see on the graph, part of that total that's rising to 12.4% has to be met by something called development fuels. Now, the UK took a slightly different direction from, from the European policy when this was introduced. Um, and set a narrower definition than advanced biofuels. Um, this was intended to encourage fuels that could be used in sectors that were hard to decarbonize. So the fuels that qualify to be a development fuel need to be hydrogen, aviation fuel, natural gas, 
um, or fuels that can be blended at high blends into petrol or diesel, and they need to come from waste or renewable electricity. So there's a, uh, it's a bit more stringent, the types of fuels that can meet the UK target than meet the, the targets that are expected in other European countries. Not shown on this graph is that we also have a greenhouse gas policy um, which sets an obligation for suppliers to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from fuels by, by 6% in 2020, um, which also drives um, biofuels as well as electric vehicles, natural gas, and upstream emissions reduction from the fossil fuel supply chain. So those are the policies that are, are, have mostly been driving and are driving biofuels uptake today. But I was asked to also to talk a little bit about other things that might encourage the use of biofuels. And one of them is the discussion about including fuels into vehicle emissions policy. Now, this is a fairly complicated diagram that shows the vehicle cycle and the fuel cycle, like on that earlier slide, of all of the emissions that go into producing, using, and disposing of a vehicle, and into producing, distributing, and using the fuel for that vehicle. The green boxes and the blue box show you the policies that affect each part of that chain at the moment. And the fuel economy standards, the CO2 standards on, on vehicles, are currently only tailpipe emissions. Now, life cycle emissions, so including all of the parts of that vehicle cycle and fuel cycle, could be a more comparable way to assess different fuels and vehicles and their, their total impact. So the European Commission has committed to evaluating the possibility of developing a methodology for life cycle emissions of cars and LCVs by 2023. So this would take into account all of those emissions at those different stages. Now, that's quite interesting from a biofuels point of view, because that means that emissions reductions that would come from using biofuels would be taken into account um, when comparing vehicles with each other. So it could boost biofuels uptake. But setting a policy like that is, is not straightforward because it's really important to make sure that everybody in this system is still incentivized to reduce their emissions. So OEMs still need to be incentivized to reduce the impact of the vehicle cycle. And overall, zero emission vehicles, which have air quality benefits um, as well as uh, CO2 reduction, also still need to be able to be incentivized. So I think that whilst this could be an additional important driver for biofuels, it needs to be done very carefully to ensure that we get the best answer overall for transport decarbonisation and to ensure that other goals like um, air quality improvement are met. I wanted just at the end to talk about aviation and marine fuels. So I mentioned these at the beginning as areas that need decarbonisation and have an interest in using alternative fuels like biofuels. And not only um, are, could biofuels be important to them, but they could actually be important to biofuels. They could bring demand, they could bring investment, and they could bring political support for, uh, for, for biofuels development. Aviation um, has been thinking about this for around 10 years um, in terms of proving the technical viability of using different types of fuels um, in, in aviation. Um, and at the moment, countries are starting to introduce aviation biofuel mandates. The first one is in place from, in Norway from the beginning of this year, and other countries are, are, have policies in development. There's also an international scheme called Corsia, um, which is managed through ICAO, the international body that, that makes agreements on aviation, um, which is about carbon offsetting and reduction from the aviation sector, um, which encourages, well, means that airlines have to reduce their emissions um, by buying offsets or by using alternative fuels. The shipping sector is at a slightly earlier stage, so it has an important share of global greenhouse gas emissions, but thinking about international policy and, and national policy in shipping is at a much earlier stage, with, as I said, many options being considered um, for how shipping could be decarbonized um, within which you know, biofuels could have a role. 
So both of these are international sectors. They're expected to grow. They've got few alternative options to liquid fuels, especially in the near term. But they also have relatively low costs compared with the cost of alternative fuels production today. And there are important things that need to be taken care of, like certification, um, to make sure that, that fuels are safe and able to be used. They could provide a new market for advanced biofuels. The question really is whether they will uh, have the willingness to pay for them. So this is just an example for the aviation sector. Um, all biofuels for, for aviation, whether conventional or advanced, are more expensive than fossil jets. Um, you can see that from the graph, um, which shows the dotted line is the fossil jet price, and the different bars are the costs of the uh, costs and prices of the different uh, biofuels uh, production options. HEFA at the left-hand side is is made. Uh, it's like the HVO route that I talked about earlier, um, and is lowest uh, in in cost, though still considerably higher than the fossil jet price. And as you move right on the graph. Uh, to different types of biofuel routes, you can see that, and, and also a power to liquid route, you can see that they get considerably more expensive. So that means that uh, many stakeholders in this area, while interested in using biofuels, they think that uh, policies will be needed to, to encourage this to happen, plus having support for early plants, not only to make sure that they happen, but to bring down some of these costs. So, my final slide, overall, what do we need to do to increase biofuels deployment in Europe? As I said, biofuel deployment has been driven by policy, and so we need to make sure that that policy is clear for the future. In the long term, this needs to be on how we're going to decarbonise transport as part of the path to net zero. What role do biofuels have and in which sectors? In the nearer term, this relies on successful implementation of RED2 in each member state across Europe. And as I said, that's happening over the next couple of years. There are also some decisions that need to be made centrally, which seem quite small um, in, when, when you read them on paper to do with how greenhouse gas emissions are calculated or things like that. But actually, some of those decisions could be really crucial for particular routes uh, in uh, establishing whether they're going to have a good business case and a large contribution to the policy. The second point here is from the industry side. The industry needs to show proof of commercial viability and sustainability for advanced biofuels. So that means getting these early commercial plants working, proving that they work, proving that the supply chains to get the feedstocks to those plants work reliably, and importantly, sharing information about the sustainability of those routes, what the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions are, whether there are any impacts from, from sourcing that biomass or from the supply chain. Because it's only by providing evidence on those things that there's going to be reassurance for policymakers and for the public that these routes are good options for the future. A challenge for those companies commercializing the advanced biofuels is access to finance. Uh, in these markets, there's uh, technology risk in some cases, as well as market risk coming from policy. So strategic investors are really important to make sure that, we, that those companies get the finance they need. And lastly, for some fuels, there are other barriers. So things like the infrastructure needed to supply gaseous fuels or standards needed to enable higher ethanol blends to be used in road transport or to get new biofuels into the aviation and marine sectors. It's always a bit negative to end on barriers, but these are really the challenges for, for us as a sector to work out how we can overcome these um, so that we can maximise the amount of decarbonisation possible um, and, and all help on the path to net zero. So that's my final slide. Um, thank you very much for, for listening. And uh, if you'd like some more information, you can visit our website on e4tech.com. And as I said, we're based in London or in Lausanne. Thank you very much, Joe, for a very interesting presentation. 
Um, <clears throat> we've got now approximately 20 minutes uh, for questions, and um, people have been um, typing in questions, I think, while the uh, webinar was going on. So are you there, Joe? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yep. So okay. the first question is, are algae biofuels an option for road transport? Do they have sufficient energy density? So they would have sufficient energy density, but that's not really the issue. So there are ways to grow algae um, that are algae that contain oils. And then you can either squash the algae to get the oils out and use that oil like a uh, vegetable oil or waste oil might be used to produce biodiesel or, or hydrocreated vegetable oil. Or there are even some algae that can um, kind of excrete the oils without you having to squash them. But, and that algae oil is relatively easy to make into a biofuel. The issue is the cost of producing that algae in the first place. Um, modeling that we've done on this just shows that the, the, the productivity of the algae and the cost of the system um, means that, that this is a, a, a very expensive way um, to make a biofuel. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the next question relates to palm oil. <clears throat> you mentioned the consideration of greenhouse gases with regard to using palm oil as a source for fuel. Is any consideration of biodiversity threat being made when considering potential fuel stocks? Yeah, I mean, uh, biodiversity threats are definitely something that are, are thought about a lot um, when comparing different uh, biofuel routes and the feedstocks um, that produce them. Um, so it, it depends on the country uh, and whether the policy that they put in place that incentivize biofuels puts restrictions on the types of biofuels that can be used. So in Europe, within the Renewable Energy Directive, there are um, requirements to uh, limit certain types of fuels, including limiting palm oil, which is, is uh, predominantly for greenhouse gas reasons, so though there are also biodiversity concerns in there. There are also a list of other sustainability requirements um, that uh, fuels need to pass uh, to, be, to be able to qualify. Okay, thank you. The next question relates to the energy required in actually producing biofuels. So the question is, how does the energy required to make biofuels, in particular where gasification is required, compared to just using electric engines? So it, uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me for this one, but in general, um, the the most highly efficient pathway for going from primary energy through to mobility is using an electric vehicle. So, you know, if you can take wind energy and use that directly in a battery to power a car, you're going to have fewer losses in that, in that uh, supply chain than you are in some other route. Um, so, for example, um, the, the, the person asking the question said, in particular where gasification is required. So that, that uh, process is about 50% efficient in energy terms from the um, energy contained in the feedstock to the energy in the fuel that is used. And then obviously the internal combustion engine um, efficiency has to be added on to that. So these are, if you think about it purely on an energy efficiency basis, then these routes have a lower energy efficiency than some other options. But we tend to think about, think about things on an energy systems basis. So how do we supply the mobility, um, heating, lighting, industrial production demands of the whole economy? And what is the, the best way to supply those? Um, and when you get to something like powering a plane or powering things that can't be electrified yet, um, your biofuels may be your best option for now. Thank you. Um, so now just moving down the, the list, um, there's a question about the agricultural land that will be required for wood-based um, bioenergy sources. So the question is, lignocellulosic or woody energy crops would require more agricultural land than is currently available, hence driving destruction of primary forest or other natural habitats. 
primary forest stores large amounts of carbon dioxide, which is required, uh, which is released to atmosphere when they are felled. Also, a monoculture crop will not support the same biodiversity as a natural habitat. I think there are a lot of good points in there. Um, I'll try and try and split them out. I mean, the first one is about primary forests. So definitely there should never be any felling of primary forests in order to grow any kind of crop for bioenergy. Um, and as I said, within the Renewable Energy Directive in Europe, there it is prohibited to use high carbon stock land to grow anything to produce biofuel. So the question is, is it a good idea to use land to produce uh, lignocellulosic or woody energy crops? And is there enough land to do that on? Um, the analyses that we've seen look at converting proportions of agricultural land and in some cases pasture land towards high yielding crops. Um, now, if done carefully, the research that I've seen says that it is possible to do that whilst increasing carbon stock. You increase carbon stock because you, there's carbon stock in the crop and there's also you can increase the soil carbon level compared with um, uh, arable crops today, for example. Um, and that there is land available to do that, even taking into account uh, land that's needed for food and not encroaching into, into natural land. Now, clearly, there are lots of variables in, in, in that assessment. So what people eat, um, how much they eat, all of these things, that, um, what, the, what the climate's like will, will affect how much land we need for food in the future. But the best analyses that I've seen that use, um, that use uh, large models of land, food, energy demand, all of these kind of things indicate that there should be land available to use to give a, a good resource of, of energy crops. Now, because this is such an uncertain area, um, there's been a lot of debate about it for the last over 10 years um, you know, of whether this is a good idea. My personal view is that I think we should do more of it now and learn more about it so that we can have better data to be able to determine, you know, can we make sure that we do this with a gain in, in carbon? Can we make sure that we, um, that we uh, can, you know, have low input? Uh, can we see what the biodiversity would be on that type of cultivation? Um, and then we could learn really what potential it might have for the future. It would not support the same biodiversity as a natural habitat, but continuing to use fossil fuels won't help biodiversity either. I mean, I, th I think that just illustrates really the, the kind of complexity of the problem and the, the trade-offs which are involved. Um, yeah, I think so. The next question really refers to you know, how much could we actually achieve by using biofuels? You know, what is the limit on availability? So the question asked was, do you think that we will be able to rely on just biofuels, not diesel and petrol, for use in internal combustion engine cars in the future? That depends how many internal combustion engine cars <laughs> there are. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that, you know, I would expect that we'll get progressive electrification of those ICE cars. I mean, we've got, uh, in many countries, there are forthcoming restrictions or bans on sales of, of ICE cars. So if what we have is a very small remainder of ICE cars that haven't been electrified driving around, then yes, we could definitely supply them with, with just biofuels. But if we don't electrify as fast as expected, um, then there may be a limit on the amount of biofuels that we'll be able to use to, to supply them. So, uh, I mean, projections that I've seen show quite marked decreases, for example, in petrol ICE cars especially, uh, sorry, actually, it was in petrol demand overall, um, less demand in diesel. So it's actually probably quite a lot. If you're talking about specifically cars, it, 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 you know, it's quite a marked demand in, um, demand reduction in both of them. So <coughs> how fast that happens how, and how much biofuels we'll be able to supply. So the next question actually probably delves a little bit deeper into some of those topics. Uh, so it says, in the next 10 years, do you see biofuels replacing more of the current uh, petrochemical diesel or more of the gasoline? And if so, will this change the proportion of IC engine production 
of each type? That's a, that's a really interesting question. So I, I think, again, this, this varies depending on the country. Um, so, for example, in Brazil and in the U.S., we've seen much more use of ethanol um, than we have of, of diesel substitutes. Uh, in the EU, we have more, more biodiesel than we, than we have ethanol. Um, the question is how, how, how easy is it and how much does it cost to supply each kind of fuel and, and what level it can be blended up to. So there are many European countries going to E10, uh, the 10% blend of, of ethanol in, in gasoline, and there are, there are those that would advocate for pushing that higher for going to, to E20, for example. Um, on the biodiesel side, as I uh, talked about before, the, you know, the, there could be limitations to use of the current vegetable or waste oil-based route. So then that really depends on the speed of commercialization of the, of the linked cellulosic um, diesel routes. Um, so I don't think that... So that answers for the first part of the question. Will it change the proportion of IC engine production of each type? I don't think it's that how much biofuels are being produced is the thing that's going to change the proportion of IC engine production. I think it's the electrification of vehicles that will uh, that will change you know how much IC engine production that you'll get. And as electrification is easier in lighter vehicles, then I would expect to see more diesel IC. Uh, proportionally because the heavy vehicles are more likely to stay around longer than the lighter vehicles. Thank you. The, well, the next question actually moves beyond um, land transportation and asks about aviation and marine. Why does the aviation and marine fuel need to be, what well, not need to be food-based? Could you please explain that a little? So, importantly, you can make aviation and marine fuel out of food-based routes. The, the, this question specifically refers to the policy support in Europe. So, on, under the Renewable Energy Directive, if a um, fuel supplier in a country supplies an aviation or marine biofuel that doesn't come from a food-based route, and that member state is allowed to count that 1.2 times towards the target. It doesn't mean they can't supply a food-based route. It just means they wouldn't get 1.2 times. They'd only get one time. I wanted to elaborate that on, a, a, on that a bit further, though, because the question is, what kind of fuel will the aviation and marine sector want to buy? So the aviation sector, for example, is very keen to avoid the criticism that has happened of the road transport sector over the past 15 years um, and the, the food versus fuel controversy. Um, so there are some airlines who have signed up the pledges to say that they will not use food-based um, biofuels at all. There are other airlines who um, may be more swayed by price than by sustainability and may think that it's less of a risk to them uh, in terms of their, their perception of their customers than, than other airlines. Um, the marine industry, as I said, is at a slightly earlier stage of discussion. So, um, you know, that, that discussion's at an earlier stage. I think this just illustrates the complexity of the overall problem and how, many, how so many sectors are, are interlinked. Um, if I could ask the next question on the, on the list, um, it's more about uh, categorizing different biofuels in, in terms of, of their greenhouse gas emissions for, for regulatory purpose. So what scope, either one, two, or three, should biofuels fall into? Uh, and what are the mechanisms you use to change the standard fossil greenhouse gas figures to those of the biofuels if they are negative value? Okay, so I guess this is from the point of view of a company that might use biofuels. Yeah. So the reference to scope one, two, and three emissions are to do with whether the, the emissions are the company's own emissions made, you know, 
on in their practices emissions that come from energy supply or emissions that come from a third party that supplies that that company so the emissions from combustion of biofuels under scope one sorry that I, I need to be really specific here the co2 emissions from combustion of biofuels under scope one accounted as zero because that co2 that's coming out of the biofuel is biogenic the uh, methane or N2O emissions that might be released um, are, would be counted because they don't, even though they're biogenic, they're still counted. Um, if the biofuel was being used by a supplier to the company, then that would be under scope three. And all of the impacts related to the production and distribution of those biofuels, because, you know, despite the fact they're counted zero at the point of combustion, that doesn't mean there haven't been greenhouse gas emissions in their supply chain. They're all accounted for in scope three. That, that's uh, quite a, a complex question, really, it in, is. in terms of looking at you know, where all the emissions occur at different points in the supply chain. Um, the mean, next it, question on the list it, is, um, assuming good government policy support and commercial investment, when might it be viable to introduce volume availability of a drop-in fuel to substitute for diesel in the UK road vehicle market? It says it's a nice, easy question. I don't know whether it is, but it's a, <laughs> crucial, it's a crucial one. So the question says. So, I mean, we have a drop-in fuel available today. We have hydro-treated vegetable oil. Um, it is possible to buy that today. It is not cheap, as I talked about. Um, it is available in volume. Um, there's a lot of demand for it at the moment because uh, the, the you know, interest in this is beginning to, to pick up in different places. Um, in terms of the potential for the lignocellulosic route that I talked about, um, uh, they will ramp up a bit more slowly because those plants, uh, as I explained, are at a... Uh, you know, they're, they're under construction today. Um, a report that you could look at for, for more details is um, E4Tech uh, did a report. It was actually a couple of years ago now, but the, the analysis was done. But the, I, I would say it still stands for the, um, for the JRC, which is uh, as part of the, the European Commission, on the potential for, for ramp up of these routes. Um, so if you want to get in touch with the contact details that are on there, I can point you to that report. Um, um, but you know we're looking at small volumes of that ramping up towards 2030 of the of the lignocellulosic route. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. For that very much, Joe. Um, I say we're, we're coming now probably towards the end of the um, webinar session. Um, so this is probably going to be the last question. Um, so that the question is. How well positioned is the UK to develop and to commercialize these technologies compared to other countries? Of a sort of economic one rather than anything else about UK PLC. So, I mean, from a UK point of view, we can, we can think about different, different parts of the supply chain here. You know, we're a relatively densely populated country with a, a, with a relatively high fuel demand compared with the amount of biomass resources that we have. However, we do have some good resource availability. So we, we are good at collecting and separating our waste uh, relatively um, compared to, you know, if you consider on a whole world level. Um, we also have some, some excellent world-class research in some of the energy crops. Um, so, for example, miscanthus, which is a grassy energy crop, we have some, we have some world-class research in that. So we have, we have potential to use the, the resources that we have. Um, we also have some um, active companies in several of the routes that I talked about. Um, and those, those are being supported in the UK through um, some competitions that have been set up uh, by the Department for Transport. Um, we had an advanced biofuels demonstration competition, and now we have a tongue twistily named Future Fuels for Flight and Freight competition, or F4C, which is supporting development of these routes in the UK. 
um, not only involving UK companies, but there are um, UK companies involved in in, in many of those um, in m many of the bids into those schemes. So that there are there are UK companies developing the technology, and also UK companies interested in in uh, offtake contracts um, uh, to to actually use the fuels that are produced. So I think that we are in a in a relatively good position to 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 lead on developing some of these routes. So thank you very much, Joe, indeed. And um, I think we've now reached the hour. So I'd like to say thank you very much indeed to Joe for what I thought was a really excellent and informative presentation. And, and thank you also for giving such a complete answer to the, the whole range of questions that were asked. And um, I hope those on the line have, have found it useful. And um, you know, thank you for participating. Okay, goodbye, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye.